William Julius Wilson wrote an essay and a book in the late 90s called When Work Disappears. Um, it discusses the incidence of jobless poverty in inner city ghettos, focusing heavily on Chicago, but with findings that were very relevant to many urban centers in the United States then and even today. It's pretty relevant to what we are trying to discuss regarding unemployment because Wilson focused heavily on the instance of jobless poverty and how it intersected with racial and geographic segregation and discrimination. Um, when Wilson was referring to the jobless poverty, he was including people who were not participating in the labor force, which means that they're not in the official unemployment account because if you are not actually currently looking for a job, then you are not counted as unemployed in the United States and by most unemployment statistics. Um, that misses a large amount of people, especially in inner city neighborhoods that have been impoverished because a lot of the structural unemployment that we see as being a challenge for the United States today is the result of people not being able to participate in the labor force for a long time for what we do call structural reasons. So structural reasons can vary from something like disability, um, which accounts for a lot of what is happening across the nation today. It can, in many cases, be something like regular, uh, regular skill gaps, which account for a lot of what happens in many impoverished neighborhoods. Um, for people who've been out of the formal job market for too long, that can also be a structural barrier to them regaining entry into the job market, which is important because Wilson brings up how getting used to an informal job market is part of the problem for jobless poverty in inner city hoods. Um, we measure this best through something we call the employment to population ratio, which is a better figure because it takes into consideration how many people in the neighborhood are employed versus the size of the neighborhood or the size of the city that you're measuring. So why do we care about this uh, jobless poverty and uh, how joblessness intersects with poverty, geographic segregation, discrimination? Um, it's because joblessness compounds poverty to make it more insidious. Wilson connects how geographically concentrated joblessness creates the social problems observed in many uh, inner city neighborhoods for African Americans. That joblessness, again, only refers to formal jobs. So most of these people do still have jobs. They're just not jobs that offer formal documentation. So perhaps they are working on a cash basis with different uh, small businesses in the neighborhood. Perhaps they're providing unpaid services. So there's been a lot more discussion about this in economic literature recently, but has been always a focus of a uh, feminist economic li literature that a lot of unpaid labor in the form of household labor is coming from women. And that is also a form of informal employment. Nobody's counting that in the unemployment statistics. Nobody is counting that in GDP, or at least nobody's counting the value of that in GDP. Um, it could also be something as black market as illegal activity. So somebody who is dealing drugs, somebody who fixes cars on the side of the road without a license, these people are also technically employed. They're just not formally employed. And that's important to remember because that contributes to our understanding of the rest of the consequences that can come out of this jobless poverty. Um, for example, if people are unemployed or people are not working formal jobs, um, the children of those families where that lack of uh, formal jobless or where that formal joblessness exists um, are kind of in this tug of war where their parents may be trying to avoid exposing them to this damaging milieu of, uh, of unstructured living, but it ends up getting general nation generationally passed on from the parents to the children. So for example, not having a job leads to very inconsistent uh, situations. Um, it, it destroys a lot of 
the sense of a regular routine that can exist and eliminates a lot of opportunities to develop discipline or to at least practice that discipline by having a regular time that you wake up, a regular uh, commute, a regular place where you go into work, expectations, responsibilities. Um, that leads to even inconsistency in schedules from day to day, and that can seep into other aspects of your life, which hinders personal planning, hinders parenting. Um, so with that in mind, families do often struggle due to this jobless poverty to parent within this environment where they have children who may unintentionally be developing antisocial norms because they are in the same inherently antisocial environment that their families are struggling within. Um, the problem with that is that those norms are essential in developing what employers and sociologists, social scientists in general call soft skills, which are usually very culturally based, right? The soft skills that people develop are usually based on their interactions with other people and how they learn to navigate not just the formal networks that exist around them, but also the uh, social interactions, the emotional networks. A lot of that is absent because families end up having to focus heavily on trying to deal with the other aspects of living in a jobless, impoverished, uh, concentrated neighborhood, right? Um, this is probably most anecdotally represented by the idea of black parents who try to keep their children off the streets and this idea of like avoiding socialization in general because of this assumption that socialization could be an open door towards criminal behavior. Um, as much as that has been dramatized in media, for better or for worse, there seems to be some evidence of that type of antisocialness being a response to concentrated poverty within the neighborhood. So it does seep into the soft skills that help determine a child's labor outcomes in the future and perpetuates this generational poverty. Um, that isn't to say that hard skills are absent from the conversation, but it's almost exogenous to what Wilson is discussing in that it's almost a foregone conclusion that if you're living in this kind of neighborhood, you are living with the fact that uh, the hard skills that come from learning in an educational environment are going to be less available to you than they would to somebody in a more affluent neighborhood just because of how schools are f typically funded by the tax revenue that residents within the neighborhood provide. So if the residents are poor, the tax revenue that they're sending to the schools are going to be very low. The quality of the schools will probably be a proxy or proxied from how much revenue they get. So it's almost a foregone conclusion in his uh, discussion that the hard skills are already lacking and then the soft skills are hindered by the fact that these children are being raised in jobless, impoverished neighborhoods. All of this is very relevant to understanding how, or understanding the consequences that we're dealing with today in the form of a Donald Trump election, in the form of an opioid crisis across the country, in the form of manufacturing job losses that have stripped away a lot of the normalcy for people in various parts of the Rust Belt. Um, that may be more present for them today, but it was an issue that had been existing for decades, 70s on, in inner city black neighborhoods. This struck those inner city black neighborhoods first, though, because of the socioeconomic vulnerability that, or socioeconomic vulnerabilities that African Americans are very regularly dealing with within the United States. Um, Another sad consequence of this is that, and another reason why we want to think of unemployment as something more so than just like these vocabulary words or these terms in a, in a textbook, is because in the Western world, especially, employment is associated with a level of self-esteem. There is a regularity that comes from having a consistent routine, but there's also an idea of who you are as a person based on the role that you fulfill within a labor force. And that is missing when that role is either informal and uh, very much unrecognized by any economic um, compensation or when it's informal and derided often in the media. So 
Yes, there is a role for the drug dealer who supplies consenting adults with substances that he then uses the revenue from to spend in a bodega that contributes to the bodega's profits or uses the revenue from that to spend on rent that contributes to the landlord's profits. These, this person still serves a role in the economy, but it's often derided because of what they're peddling or distributing. Same thing for sex workers who are also serving a role, at least in the form of meeting a demand and then using that revenue to push cash through the economy. These people are contributing to the velocity of money. They are contributing to economic activity, but there's often a, a upward nose tilted towards their professions that probably does play out in the self-esteem side of things. Um, other aspect that Wilson brings up, which is probably one more so a shortcoming of his insight into things even back in the 90s, is that women in inner city neighborhoods who are in many cases saddled with single parenthood are both the primary child care provider and the primary breadwinner in the family. Because of the structure of welfare in the 1990s, there was a hypothesized suspicion that women who opted for welfare for alleviation, at least from the breadwinning side, were only going to be sent deeper into poverty and encourage fathers to be absent from households. Now, while there is some case to be made that the way the welfare was structured prior to the 1995 was definitely, uh, it definitely incentivized to some extent a breakup of households. The response that happened in the 90s was to then make work a requirement for many forms of aid from the federal level. Because this wasn't accompanied with a jobs program, which was the other part of Wilson's suggestions, it had a very, very awful uh, impact economically on single parent women and sing or women who led, who were the single leaders of households. Um, needless to say, a lot of people fell off of the welfare, so the welfare roles diminished, but a lot of those women who fell off just were left with nothing. They didn't fall off and enter the job market. They fell off and because of the structural challenges that they were dealing with in finding jobs, were just sent deeper into poverty. Um, Wilson contributed to the conversation around, wel around welfare reform in the 90s, but it's very interesting that this jobs program aspect that he argued for tremendously in his book and essay were more or less ignored in the final legislation that was uh, provided, that came out of these discussions around reforming welfare. Um, another aspect to keep in mind is that the geographic concentration of jobless poverty also contributed to its perpetuation. So employers can racially discriminate on an implicit level that's harder to detect by avoiding applicants from certain zip codes if they know that those zip codes have a concentration of low income, impoverished, often structurally disconnected from the labor force people. Um, they can also discriminate based on these zip codes, based on their, or discriminate against certain zip codes based on their impressions of work ethic and skills that accompany these zip codes. So economists and sociologists often call this uh, statistical discrimination where an employer basically assumes based on statistical knowledge of the aggregate about a group of people what any individual person will be like. So based on an employer's understanding of the statistical data on African Americans in aggregate, as far as educational attainment, as far as employment histories, as far as uh, maybe even things like soft skills, if they could be measured, hard skills for sure, they will discriminate based on those statistics or bring those statistics into their decision making for any individual applicant from that background. So any individual African American, any individual African American woman um, that all tends to perpetuate the jobless poverty that was originally the issue. So if you were structurally unemployed, the chances of you moving from that structural unemployment into employment diminish significantly, even if just for this reason. Um, one of the things that's very interesting, though, to keep in mind for today 
are the three reasons that Wilson identifies for why jobless poverty existed. And even in the 1990s, he was observing these trends that are very relevant to what's happening today. The cause of jobless poverty being rooted in nationwide economic shifting, that is a reduction in the demand for low-skilled labor. And the, the shifting started to impact inner city neighborhoods first because of the socioeconomic vulnerability of African Americans, but today it has spread to much of the United States' low-skilled workforce. So the drivers of this reduced demand of the low-skilled labor, as Wilson identifies them, are one, the computerization slash automation of the economy. Um, anybody who's familiar with the Yang campaign platforms would argue that this is still definitely a problem today. Um, increased college enrollment, which reduces the costs of employing high-skilled labor through the supply and demand mechanism. So even then, I think in the 90s, he was probably looking at a situation where a quarter to maybe 20 percent of the United States, and probably even less than 20 percent of the United States, had a college degree. And today that is bordering into the third of the U.S. having a college degree that push towards getting people into colleges as well intentioned as it was led to a growing disconnect between job opportunities and wages for people on the high end of the skill of uh, spectrum versus the low end of the skill spectrum. Um, finally, he identifies economic globalization, which reduced the price of imports, which are typically the things that we import in the United States are typically goods and sometimes services that are much more readily provided by low-skilled laborers. So by reducing the price of these imports, it had, an, it had a multiple order effect on reducing the demand for low-skilled labor within the United States. And on top of that, we increased the output for export industries which are typically in the United States industries that use a lot of high skill labor. So I know in previous in a previous video, I discussed that the trade imbalances have very little to do with wages domestically, which is true because wages domestically are much more dependent upon demand and supply for labor. But through multiple orders that demand and supply of labor can be influenced by what type of products we choose to import versus what type of products we choose to export. So while trade on its own isn't necessarily a cause of wages decreasing, the things that we trade and what we prioritize trading can influence that by restructuring our economy and therefore restructuring the demand for labor that we have. Um, Wilson does include a some public policies. So again, he emphasizes heavily a WPA style jobs program, which would basically be akin to the idea of a jobs guarantee that has been promoted, especially in the um, 2020 campaigns that have happened. Um, but the hope for public policies to address these issues, even in Wilson's opinion, was bleak in the 90s, if for no other reason than the racial amicus animus. I'm sorry. Um, the the racial anger that often is cloaked by proxy terms for race that gets dredged up by the conservative side of the political spectrum when it comes time to determine budget priorities. So for example, even terms like taxpayers implies that people who do not on net pay taxes are in some ways freeloading off of the benefits from taxes. Um, in many cases, terms like that can become proxies for race and allows people to participate in racism or in racial racist ideas. Because I want to be careful in using the term racist in the sense that there are people who do not necessarily hold power, who hold prejudicial ideas but there are also people who hold power who may be employers who hold concepts that may be inherently racist because of the power that they hold to make decisions about people's lives. It allows people in those positions of power to participate in racist dabbling by cloaking their racism in not racist concepts. 
I am not a racist if I am against taxpayer money being used to benefit freeloaders. All you've done is replaced taxpayer, replaced white with taxpayer and freeloaders with black. Going through that sentence again, it becomes very clear what the implications are. And in many cases and in many ways, the conservative side of the political spectrum has played on these uh, proxies and just turn to the Southern strategy for the GOP and you'll get a very clear layout on how proxy terms can often be used to be dog whistles for uh, people to have uh, sentiments that go along these lines of I have paid money into a system and people who do not pay money to the system look like this and don't deserve my money. Um, he, Wilson recognized how this could turn people against each other and how this rhetoric would become very much so amplified with anxieties that typically followed economic crises. So for Wilson, he was looking more so at the recession of 1990 to 1992. Today, all you have to do is look back at the recession of 2008 to 2009 and you can see that a lot of what's played out since then, culminating in the election of President Donald Trump, is the result of these economic anxieties around security, future of jobs, future generations. Will my child have a better outcome than me? How can I be assured of that if my own neighborhood is losing manufacturing jobs to other places, largely because the United States no longer has a comparative advantage in manufacturing? This allowed certain parts of the political spectrum to play on these ideas of it's the United States versus immigrants, it's the United States versus China, it's US taxpayers versus freeloaders who want nothing to do but just extract from the system and never pay their own part in. Um, the sad part is that even with the heads up that we got from Wilson in the 90s, we have fallen down this path and it's very natural in the sense that the reason Wilson was able to was able to write about this is because of how predictable human behavior is, human sociology is, economics is, but it's unfortunate that even with that heads up, here we are again dealing with economic anxieties that are leading us to turn against one another more so than organize for what Wilson was really advocating, which was a more racially blind public policy, fiscal policy that would effectively guarantee every American a job as long as they were willing to work.